this computer. All right, so we are recording. Thank you for all coming. Um, more people may show up. James and Pam, bless them, are going to be uh, helping to moderate and they'll keep the eye on the chat box because I probably won't. And also on the participants. So as you see people pop up saying they want to get in, just hit the admit button. And uh, if you see things in the, in the chat box, then uh, just keep note of the questions as they come up, James, because the format I'm going to use for this is to uh, sort of cover one or two or as many as five questions in one go with the debrief and then pause for feedback where I think the question is likely to merit greater discussion. I may just do one and then do some short discussion. We've got a maximum time box of two hours. I want to finish at 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern, and whatever time that is where everybody else is, um, to be respectful to everybody so we can all go and have a rest or get on with our lives. Um, so I'll try and keep it succinct, and we'll go where the, where the questions take us. So I'm going to share my screen and find now, share my keynote deck, which I prepared earlier on, and I'm just going to hit the play button on this. And I'll try and go into a grid view so I can see people. And this is really the format I'm going to do it. So I'm going to run through the questions in the order that I prepared them. And, and the order they were asked, people were asked them were in a, in a randomized set. And I'm going to talk about the question and, and debrief it. Um, and then I'll pause when I think there's a, a good opportunity. If some of the questions are very close together, I'll continue. Um, and if somebody really wants to protest, just ping the moderators and they'll stop me en route if it really is something we need to talk about pretty rapidly. So the first question, I, one of the questions that caused a lot of controversy as well online, but the first question I, uh, I put in there was, what is the primary purpose of the Daily Scrum? Now, these results were screenshotted today, so they include any late-breaking results. And uh, what we got at the moment, we got a 38% hit rate on correct answers, um, 217 people answered planning, and then a very similar number of other people answered a bunch of the other answers that were there. And I just made these things up. And so let's have a look what the uh, Scrum Guide says about this, and then we'll talk about, I may pause because this one did create a lot of controversy, but the Scrum Guide's literal reading of this is the daily Scrum is held at the end of every sprint, held every day, of the sprint, I'm sorry. And at it, the development team plans work for the next 24 hours. This optimizes team collaboration and performance by inspecting the work since the last daily scrum and forecasting upcoming sprint work. So I said it clearly states that the dev team plans work for the next 24 hours and it optimizes team collaboration. And later in the uh, daily scrum definition, the scrum guy goes on to state, it improves communication, eliminates other meetings, identifies impediments to development work for removal, highlight and promote quick decision making and improve the development team's level of knowledge. So therefore, the primary answer was planning. But this, I'm going to stop the slides for a moment and go back to the, uh, to the meeting screen because this was one question that created a lot of consternation so i'm going to i don't know if there's any questions already but i want to know if anybody wants to um add anything into the my interpretation of the daily scrum primarily being for planning and i'll add some additional comments i'm going to just see if anybody wants to chime in on video or to ask a question in the chat box on that particular question Oh, I've <laughs> okay, so clearly said, so I'll move on. But this is what I'm going to do. And if we get to, uh, th there will be other questions that get a bit more contentious, but to give you an idea of how I'm going to make this work. The other thing to tell you, I do know Ken Schwaber. I'm a PST and I'm very fortunate to have, uh, have been able to talk to Ken on a few occasions. But Scrum is, dis dis uh, is described as a planning cadence, not a delivery cadence a planning cadence. And I can go through, I won't do it now, but I can go through and teach why every event and activity in Scrum is actually a planning focus rather than a delivery focus. But it is described by Ken as a planning cadence. It doesn't say that in the Scrum Guide, but if you think about each of the events in Scrum and the focus, 
is you are continuously planning throughout the sprint. Even the sprint review and the sprint retrospective are planning. And we'll get a little bit deeper into those as we go. Let me bring the slides back up. So where do we get to? So this was one I think that aggravated a few of my online uh, comments on LinkedIn. But what, what term best describes agility? Now I was accused of asking trick questions. A trick question is what has no, no, uh, no arms and no legs, uh, but has hands. And, and the answer is a clock. So that's the sort of, that's a trick question. Um, this isn't a trick question. It meant, I expected people to read it and interpret it, but what best to, describes agility, agile being, I guess, the noun that everybody would associate with the classes we've all been in, which says, you know, the mindset is, the agile mindset is X, Y, Z. But when I talk about agility, I talk about agility being an emergent property. So this is what I debriefed. These are the notes I wrote. Go ahead. I thought I missed something there. Um, so basically, agility means the ability to move quickly and easily. Um, there's some other things in, in sports about hand-eye coordination, mental agility and alertness. Um, uh, in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the American Dictionary, it says the quality or state of being agile. So agility is about being agile. And agility is always described as an emergent property. Uh, it's not something you do, it's something you develop. You desire to be agile, you gain agility. Being able to change direction quickly, in business we talk about pivoting, uh, responding to market demands, responding to emergent learning and, ch and choosing a different course. And that's something you develop an ability of. You don't, uh, I, I think I'd said to somebody, if I'm sitting on the sofa, uh, not having any exercise and eating chocolate and drinking beer profusely for weeks on end, I don't just then suddenly stand up and announce I'm going to be agile. I now have to work at being agile and to gain agility. So that was the sort of debrief on that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on unless anybody protests to the moderators and then they will sort of flag me to stop and we'll have a conversation the next one i went on this is going to get us into a couple of really interesting spots here the next thing i asked is what is empiricism so as professionals and practitioners we should understand empiricism the empirical process and empiricism and we should understand the roots of empiricism I'll go into the debrief in a second on the next slide, but this question did catch a lot of people out. I'm looking at the data on my screen, 24% thereabouts got it correct. Uh, everybody else was sort of across the board. And actually it was quite, the highest response was PDCA, which is plan, do, check, act, which is Toyota's approach to Deming's PD, PDSA cycle, which is an empirical process, but it's not the it isn't the definition of empiricism. So empiricism is what's called uh, um, inductive reasoning. And there was a guy who lived in 1620, conveniently a Brit, Sir Francis Bacon. He's called the father of empiricism and he developed this technique called inductive reasoning. The other two types are deductive reasoning, the type of reasoning that Sherlock Holmes does, and abductive reasoning, which is an observation, starts with an, uh, an observation or a set of observation, uh, observations and then seeks to find the simplest and most likely conclusion from the observation, a plausible conclusion, but not po uh, positively verified. Where empiricism is at the heart of the modern scientific methods. So you have a hypothesis, you do an experiment, you have a conclusion. That's empiricism. Deductive reasoning uses a reductive technique very much like we would use in 5Y analysis. Um, any questions at all from the audience thus far? Because the next question is really going to light the house on fire. Are we good? Um, good. Well, there's, some okay. statements here. there's some statements here. And Let me I'm just drop out of here so I can see the screen. I'm sorry. There is one that says... You ready? Yeah, go ahead. I, I can see them now. So point out to me. Yeah. So I was like Javier mentions also addressing when to depart from the scrum guide sure. and, uh, you know, following the rules too strictly. And yeah. then there's also one about 
agility, maybe Danielle can elaborate more about an uppercase or lowercase a for agility. Well, I don't, I don't subscribe to that nonsense, by the okay. way. Just, 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 I mean, you can hit me back and hurt me and hit me just as hard. It's fine. Uh, just to pick up on a couple of things with Javier. Um, my purpose in doing this little quiz, because I'd sort of done a quiz. Um, I'd done a quiz on sort of the, 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 this thing behind me, this, the, the flow system and some of the concepts in there. And I thought, well, I'll just do a scrum one for a bit of fun. And I, I sort of wrote down a bunch of questions I typically ask at interview when I'm interviewing prospective scrum practitioners or agile practitioners, not necessarily scrum masters, but people who, um, who, who come, who've come to me for work in the past. And I've interviewed, and Pam will tell you, I interviewed over a thousand in the space of a year. So I, I'm, I'm pretty well versed of interviewing agile practitioners and people from the world of agile and scrum and, and lean and Toyota practitioners. And so I wrote down a few things I'd ask because it was really just a test of understanding. So my view is if you're going to, wave a bright shiny certificate saying I am certified in Scrum, then you should have a deep knowledge in Scrum. If you say I've just learned Scrum and I'm practicing and there's a lot of things I don't know, that's good. That's transparency, that's honesty and openness. If you say I'm a deep expert, <laughs> I can see Harry there. If I, if, uh, hey Harry, if I, if I say I'm a deep expert and I have all these certifications and I'm an agile coach, then I expect to have that, you have that deep understanding and knowledge, but then that doesn't mean you have to apply the rules as in the rule book, because Scrum is a technique, it's a behavioral pattern, some call it a framework. I'm, I'm supposed to call it a framework, I'm a professional Scrum trainer, but my view is it's, it's, it's the definition of a framework is a, a lightweight structure or a basic structure onto which other things can be built. And Scrum can be, that framework, that basic scaffolding to help you do all the things. But at the same time, if you execute Scrum as designed, because if it's not, then it's not Scrum, it's something else that looks like or sounds like Scrum, but it's not Scrum, then uh, it becomes a standardized repeatable process. So therefore it becomes a behavioral framework because the way it creates behavior, behavioral characteristics helps us to work in a standardized repeatable way. So, you can deviate and you, you should never just take any one thing and just do it. It is one of the many techniques and this thing behind me, it's one of many things that I recommend people become proficient in and use where it contextually fits. Please don't use Scrum in an operating room. You may have undesirable results. Yeah. Iterative development in an operating room probably isn't the best approach. I'm just, just my idea. If you want to disagree, of course we can. Deductive reasoning, somebody's just asked that. That's what Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes does. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reshare the slides because it makes me seem a lot cleverer because there's a good definition on there of deductive reasoning. So it's what's known as top-down logic. It contrasts with inductive reasoning, which is the empirical way we do things, which they consider is bottom-up logic. These are definitions from the, the literature, from the uh, peer-reviewed learned literature. So inductive reasoning, a conclusion is reached reductively. So like 5Y analysis, you start with a big problem, you ask, you ask why and why and why and why, and you're narrowing it down, hopefully to a single root cause. But in inductive reasoning, the empiric empiricism, the conclusion is reached by generalizing or extrapolating from specific cases. So you may make a wild generalization about something that if you, you know, if you see, if all you've ever seen is white sheep, you will conclude that all sheep are white. But we know that's, we know that's not true, but that reasoning would reach a conclusion that based upon your observations and data, all sheep are white. But then you would need to do further experiments to prove that that generalization was correct well when you do deductive reasoning you're actually working on facts this is the whole essence of toyota fact-based work and you're examining the facts and gradually honing in by reducing down the data until you get up to a root cause um i'm glad to see rogers on here because he's a real scientist and explains this much better than i if i do make a mistake i'm going to move on because of time, I'm going to moderate myself a little bit, but I want to talk about this because this is the one 
that actually people are going to be blown away and stunned by, but I'm going to make this very clear that Ken is somebody I hold in high esteem, Ken Schwaber in high esteem, is a great intellect and he's actually a really, really nice guy and he's been very magnanimous in having conversations with myself and Dave West about this. And even Dave West was a pretty, was stunned by and told me. So I did a lot of research into empiricism, not just recently in, in the last four or five years when teaching my classes. And of course I work with Professor John Turner from UNT. So I'm studi studying the, the literature as well. And I asked what the three pillars of empiricism were, because if you Google the pillars of empiricism, you'll get millions of hits that say transparency, inspection and adaptation. And kudos to the hundred people who answered, there are no pillars of empiricism because there are no pillars of empiricism. I'm going to share something with you now, and I'm writing a paper on this, but I'm going to share something with you. I said, this is what's known as the illusion of truth. If you repeat something over and over again enough, it becomes a truth. Um, I won't give you the origins of that. You can Google that because it, it comes from sort of wartime. But um, if you... Simply, as I say, if you search Google, you'll find this. This is a creation of Ken Schwabers. In 2004, in his book that he wrote with Mike Beadle, and Mike Beadle passed away a couple of years ago due to crime and sad loss to the uh, Scrum community. But Ken originally called them visibility inspection adaptation. If you go dig up the book, you can read it on get excerpts online. So I spoke to Ken and I talked to Dave West. And Ken wrote me a really, really nice email. And I didn't put it all here because there's more information in there I'll bring out in a, a paper I'm writing with John. But he says, yes, this is a quote. I formulated slash invented it based on empirical process control. Scrum is consonant with empirical process control. And that basically means it's an agreement we're in harmony, harmony with. Ken had studied a particular book uh, called Process Dynamics Modeling and Control by an African professor who goes by the name Tunde, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And he was working at uh, DuPont and Ken's brother worked at DuPont. So Ken had a lot of connection with the, uh, the departments there. And he, he's quoted as saying he went, uh, in one of my slide decks, he's quoted as saying that he went to see the people at DuPont and they said he was crazy implementing a plan-driven approach and told him to implement an empirical approach. So he studied Tunde's work and, and Ken goes on to say, and he quotes, it is a derivation of a steam pressure chamber or other chaotic chemical or biological process. The roots are the same, transparency, inspection, adaptation. But he says, then again, the use of empiricism for software development was an epiphany. Tunde described it to me and reviewed what I was doing. However, Scrum is our own invention. And then he sent me a, a, a parable, a story he'd written to describe those ideas. So there are no pillars of empiricism. I'm going to switch back to the meeting so I can see everybody. There are no pick, uh, pillars of empiricism. They are a made-up construct in Scrum. It doesn't mean Scrum is wrong using them. It doesn't mean that Scrum doesn't have an empirical process or an empirical model, but people need to understand that transparency, inspection, and adaptation were originally visibility, inspection, and adaptation, and that this is a construct within Scrum. So when you go and teach and coach and tell people about the pillars of empiricism, please remember it's constrained by the description of Scrum. It's not the original science and it's not the original research that goes through hundreds of years. I went back into the literature from 1620 and then many scholars, both in England and the USA, who have studied this over the years. Any comments, questions? Um, someone has written, isn't experimentation a pillar of empiricism, Nigel? Yes. Well, empiricism is, it is so... Oh, in person, a philosophy. Well, yes, I guess all science starts as philosophy. I mean, if you go and read the, I mean, not everybody agrees with deductive reasoning either. And if you look at abductive reasoning, which is a lot of the complexity uh, uh, experts are working in now, and people like Dave Snowden, who I work closely with, not everybody agrees with that either. Uh, uh, ironically, not everybody agrees with 5Y analysis or deductive reasoning. But the, the idea of empiricism, it is considered 
the sort of foundational piece of the modern scientific method, which has been around for hundreds of years. They sort of started out with the uh, Aristotle, then Galileo, uh, sorry, Aristotle, Copernicus, Galileo, Bacon, and then a number of other scholars that followed on from there. Uh, and actually you can trace empiricism back beyond those, some of the early writings of Plato and, and things of that nature. I'm not a historian, I just read this stuff. Um, so, but empiricism is the heart of the, or the foundation of the modern scientific method, which is hypothesis, experiment, conclusion. The conclusion drives your next hypothesis. You did that in university, those that went to university and, and studied science and these things. Interestingly, when we connect the dots, this is where PDSA or PDCA, whichever ver version you prefer, starts to look very much like hypothesis experiment conclusion because Walter Schuart, who was Deming's mentor, had the Schuart cycle, which was specification, production, inspection, and repeat. That was an empirical process. PDSA was an extension of that. PDSA came from the total quality movement and actually we almost got the final piece of evidence. It actually came from my friend Charlie Protzman's grandfather because he worked on the very first uh, quality management courses in Japan with uh, a couple of other folks uh, for, uh, in post-World War II Japan. But all these things are empirical processes. And I've actually been quoted, as in, and James has been in my classroom when I've said this before, is that Scrum looks very much like PDCA with some time boxes and what people call a Kanban board, which they should really call an Andon display using a Kanban tool. But it very much looks like a bit of Kanban with time boxes and PDCA. And then a couple of formalized roles to control the process. Now, I don't want to demean Scrum and, and reduce it to that, but essentially all these approaches have their origins in the same place. And it all goes back to the empiri into empiricism. Pam, are you, what, you're waving at me to move on. No, Mary has written to, to understand better. Oh, it just jumped. You're saying transparency, adaptation, and inspection are pillars of Scrum and not pure pillars of empiricism. Is that what you're saying? They are pillars of the empirical method within Scrum. They're not pillars of empiricism as in empiricism which is defined as inductive reasoning which is the heart of the modern scientific method they are pillars of the empirical method within scrums which is based upon empirical thinking does that make it clear did that make it more unclear mary good you wave at me or just thumbs up awesome roger did you i saw your hand it's got to sink in nigel okay all right, let's move on. We good? All right. Yes, so, thank you. Uh, all right, good stuff. Let's see where we go next. Um, so, Scrum requires, oh dear me, this is awesome. <laughs> so much hassle on this. Scrum requires a team of between three and nine people. Requires, requires. This was the key word, requires. And, and apart from a couple of folks who said only in a large organization, which are thrown as a red herring, true and false, but the majority thought it was true. Let's see what Scrum actually says. I'm sorry, there's a lot of text here. I'll do my best. Um, I talked about another illusion of truth and, and I'm gonna upset the folks from the safe world here and, and I still haven't determined where they got this number from. But a lot of people talk about seven plus or minus two. That actually has nothing whatsoever to do with team size. And I've been unable to find any references in the literature to where it relates to team size. It actually comes from psychology, from a paper in 1956, a very well cited paper from a cognitive psychologist called George Miller. It's sometimes known as Miller's Law. And it, actually seven plus or minus two is a psychological measure of how many things we as humans can hold in short-term memory. So if you're gonna remember, remember a bunch of things, it's about seven plus or minus two. So I was unable to get anybody to give me any hints of this. And there is a guy uh, called, uh, called Mike Beltzner that you can Google, who came up with the phrase Miller's Law, uh, caught, talking about a, a different Miller called Dave Miller. Uh, it was all some product I know nothing about called Bugzilla. 
Um, it was some sort of software product and they wrote some sort of words that are written on the screen there to come up with Miller's law. But seven plus or minus two is from psychology. It's about your short term memory. So I have no idea where it came to be team size. I've not got anybody to give me a reference for that. If anybody knows one, please tell us now or send one to me. So what the Scrum Guide actually says, optimal development team size is small enough to remain nimble and large enough to complete significant work within a sprint. Fewer than three development team members decrease interaction and results in smaller productivity gains. Smaller development teams may encounter skill constraints during the sprint, uh, causing the development team to be unable to deliver a potentially releasable increment. Having more than nine members requires too much coordination. Large development teams generate too much complexity for an empirical process to be useful. The product owner and scrum master roles are not included in this count unless they are also execute, executing work in the sprint backlog. The Scrum is strongly recommending a range of three to nine, but it doesn't require it and does not mandate it. I've worked with teams that have been larger than nine people, and there are some challenges with that, but they've still been able to use Scrum reasonably effectively. I then put in this extra note, which is just my opinion, and it was just a bit of fun that drove everybody bonkers. Um, uh, I said that if you include the scrum master and product owner, then the overall team size would be five plus or minus 11, which drove everybody bonkers. But we're talking about the development team size here. It's not a measure of the scrum team. And people have to remember we have the scrum team and the development team are different constructs or concepts in, in scrum. I'm going to stop the share for a minute on that and come back to the, uh, the, the videos. Uh, <laughs> Danielle's like trickster. Uh, so, um, but, and, and you know, I mean, people, I've seen what Jovan's written, or Jovan, I'm not sure which way to pronounce, so I apologize. Um, and then I'm reading Sean's comment in Jeff Sutherland, James, Jim Copeland's book, The Spirit of the Game Through Tradition recommends team sizes of seven plus or minus two effective tens teams tend to be smaller. So again, recommends, recommends, but I still don't know where their scientific basis of seven plus or minus two comes from. And actually Jim and I went toe to toe the other day in one of my LinkedIn threads, which was exhausting and still didn't get, I asked him outright, where does it come from? And he didn't give me an answer, wouldn't give me an answer. And I worked for Jeff. I don't know if you, a lot of people realize that I spent nearly three years working for Jeff and uh, teaching for scrumming because of CST and, and beyond. And uh, we never used the seven plus or minus two. And I actually went back to Mitch Lacey's website, who's a well-known scrum coach. And he has a copy of all the scrum guides going back to version one written by the Scrum Alliance because if you're not aware, Ken Schwaber actually started the Scrum Alliance originally. And in every single scrum guide, it does not say seven plus or minus two. In any of them, it says three to nine as a recommendation. So are, the, yeah, go ahead. Are moderators allowed to have questions? Of course. Okay. <laughs> so you ask about um, you know, team size of three to nine, and it's, essentially it's one comment on here said it, it strongly implies uh, its, its requirement. But I was going to ask well, where the scrum guide is silent, what is to be implied? Is it, is it implied that it's supposed to be required, or is it implied supposed to be that it's flexible? So I really wish we had Ken or somebody to answer that directly. Right? <laughs> the, the interpretation as a trainer, um, it, as a professional scrum trainer, I guess, but in, and there are trainers out there who are much better at me than this in interpreting the scrum, scrum guide, and I do make that very clear, is that it is a strong recommendation that they give an explanation why they think too small or too large is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it, it isn't the law. Like the, <laughs> I've gone seeing some of the comments roll up in there. So look at the chat comments that people are putting up. Um, but it, it's not one of the immutable rules in there. Things that are very clear, there's only one product owner. And I've argued for years with Ken and the, the PST community about the whole one product owner thing. I've even written articles on LinkedIn about the, product, the great product owner challenge. But Scrum says the rule, one product owner. And the, 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 the Scrum guide says one Scrum master. And then, the, but when it comes to team size, it doesn't say the rule is. It says 
this is our thinking. So as a good scrum master, a good scrum practitioner, you should know that and you should know why it's recommended, but also know that it isn't a hard and fast rule because the reality in life is in some companies, you're never going to be able to enforce that rule. And, um, and if you stand there going, well, no, if it's bigger than nine, I'm not, I'm not going to coach this team. You'll be quickly on the finding another job uh, list. So it's really just a matter of understanding in, in, uh, oh yeah, I'm <laughs> okay. Daniel's teasing me now because she's saying, does it say one scrum? Well, we're going to get into this and we're going to get into this. So bring up the scrum guide while we're talking. We'll have a look at that, but I'll get into the product owner in a minute as well. And then Roger's writing some good stuff about abductive oh, reasoning. Roger is like one of, you know, when you go and you see these guys selling things cheaply on a market or on a suitcase and there's somebody says, yeah, I'll take one. Well, that's Roger because he's a friendly in the audience, but he is also an incredibly clever guy. He's a real scientist. Now he, he's a real scientist, not, not a made up one, a real one. And, um, and he's also been coaching Lee for about 20 years in lean healthcare. And he's also been coaching scrum. He worked at Toyota with me and he's worked in some other organizations as well. So he's reasonably good on what he's talking about. So he's putting some notes in there for people who were struggling with abductive, inductive, deductive reasoning. All right, I'm going to move on because otherwise the excitement will stop. Um, okay, so let's talk about backlog refinement. This was an easier one, but it worried me a bit, folks, because I just said backlog refinement is an event, an activity, optional, a product owner role, another term for sprint planning. Well, this is, a, this is one you should never get wrong. This is one you should know. It's not optional. Uh, it's definitely not a product owner role, although or the, obviously the product owner participates. It's not a product owner only function. It's definitely not another term for sprint planning. It's a prereq for sprint planning. Um, and uh, it's described as it's not actually called out as an event. Now in Scrum, things are called events, not meetings, not ceremonies. Ceremonies are births and, and marriages and done at least two of one of those um and um and it's not a meeting because meetings are boring and people hate meetings and try and avoid them and don't really pay attention so it's just they described as events because they wanted them to be more memorable you know a sprint review is this great event when you're showing fantastic value delivered to a customer and the customer is engaging and giving you great feedback and you're not doing a demo you're doing a review because the customer's playing with the product that you're showing them that's the general gist so it's an event it's meant to be memorable um, but in scrum they describe five events three five three um, but they don't describe backlog refinement as an event it is an activity so and this is just a definition so here's what the scrum guide says um, now and the other definition of the event in scrum is is when scrum uh, an event happens at a prescribed time in the sprint so sprint planning happens at the beginning, not at the end or in the middle. Um, the daily scrum happens daily. It says so in the scrum guide. And the sprint review happens at the end of the sprint just before the retrospective. And then the retrospective is the last thing we do before the next sprint starts. Um, so backlog refinement, and this is what the scrum guide says, is the act of adding detail, estimates. We estimate at backlog refinement. We'll get to that a little bit, a little while. And we order, prioritize items in the product backlog. This is an ongoing process in which the product owner and development team collaborate on the details on the, of product backlog items. So it's an ongoing process. That's an activity. And there's some definition from the dictionary there on the screen a little lower down. During product backlog refinement, items are reviewed and revised. The scrum team, ah, so this is the development team, the product owner, and the scrum master being present now, scrum team as opposed to development team, decides how and when refinement is done. Refinement usually consumes no more than 10% of the capacity of the development team. So if you're in the standard two-week sprint, that's eight hours. That's a whole day of refinement. That's one of the things I get into a lot with refinement when people say, we do an hour every two weeks. And how's that working for you? However, product backlog items can be updated at any time by the product owner 
or at the product owner's discretion. So prioritization and, and updates to PBIs is ongoing all the time. And the product owner is able to do that or give or, or acknowledge other people doing that. It's not just the product owner doing it, but the product owner needs to be aware and to be okay with the updates. But this is an ongoing activity that happens all the time. It is not an event. Um, any feedback on the backlog refinement uh, aspect? We'll move on if not. Okay, let's move on. If, if there is, just put it in the chat box. We'll come back to it. So let's talk about the retrospective um, because this is probably one of the most important parts. I've studied a lot of work by a gentleman called Scott Tannenbaum and actually a lot of the stuff in the, the flow system that I've been working on with Professor Turner and, and Brian Rivera is looking at what's called effective debriefing. So Scott Tannenbaum has done a lot of work on what's known as effective debriefing. The retrospective is a debriefing of the sprint. This is how I teach. This is how we, we encourage people to use the retrospective. Now, 84%, 88 plus percent there got this on the nose. Uh, it's a time, and this is verbose out of the scrum guide, a time to create a plan for implement. See plan, you see that word plan again? It's planning. Retrospective is a planning cadence. A time to create a plan for implementing improvements to the way the scrum team does its work the others were just things i made up because a lot of people use it to to whine about issues and complain um they build marshmallow towers with pasta sticks and things and do nonsense like that which has nothing to do with debriefing the sprint and it's nothing to do with team building by the way and i'll answer that in more detail if people have an issue with that um it's not a time for people to catch up on work not completed before sprint review because the sprint review was the end of the sprint of, or the end of the work effectively. And it's not a time to vote on Kaizen stories, although we may create some actionable items that may go into our backlog, should go into our backlog, and we may refer to them as a Kaizen or as a continuous improvement activity. Um, and that was it. That's all I really put on that. Um, any questions on the retrospective? Because I think this is, we've probably done daily scrum. We've hit on a couple of others and we've hit on retro now. Is there any feedback on that so far? Not seeing anything in the chat coming up, but you said you would elaborate more in the team, uh, the team activities or whatever. So I just wanted to give that, give you an opportunity to do that. So I'm gonna be brief, but I'm going to a bit later on if time allows. Um, team building, uh, taking people to escape rooms or building marshmallow towers and things. The reason they don't work is because they're out of context. What we need to be teaching people is how to be teams. We need to be teaching people effective communication, active listening, challenge response communication, shared cognitions, how to build shared mental models. When we go into a retrospective, we need to be debriefing what happened in the sprint because and somebody's written only one retro per sprint. Now, according to the Scrum Guide, there's one retrospective. That's one of the prescribed events. My view is you can retrospect at any time, and you should retrospect at any time that's necessary or appropriate. So if you have an event that occurs during, the, during your sprint or during any period of work, if something happens that's a notable event, positive or negative, you should then capture relevant information at, that's pertinent so you can use that at the retrospective when you're debriefing based on facts. But if it's a significant enough event retrospect immediately take the information and immediately debrief what has happened and decide on an improvement or an action based upon that and the, so there's no rule that says retrospection is only once a sprint and if you're in those really long Don't sprints you know. enter people. your meeting id followed by pound <laughs> somebody's logging on to another meeting um but on the team building thing so with teamwork, we are trying to build effective teams. We teach people how to do tasks, activity really well. We've got some really talented people who can you, do... You have not That's not me, I promise. Um, who can do activity really, really well. But what we don't get is we don't get taught how to be a team. 
how to interrelate with each other and certain other aspects. And I was talking to a gentleman from Australia earlier today, and we were talking on a coaching call about this is ask people what their planning process is. Ask people how they plan and they'll look at you and they'll go, Oh, we get in a room. We sort of talk with each other. We look at the backlog, but what's your process for planning? How, what's your structured approach to planning? What's your structured approach to debriefing? Your daily scrum, do you just do what it says in the scrum guide or do you just hang out and mumble things to each other or do you have a structure to it? Not passing a talking stick to each other, which is hideous, but you know, do you have a way of actually structuring the way it works? And that's actually um, part of building team working capability. And I'm going to move away from that because we'll get off down a tangent. But if there's anybody wants to ask any questions on it, I'll dig into that a little bit more deeply as time allows. So a senior, this was a good one, a senior scrum master is what? The majority of people said there's no such thing. And, 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 and I put some other nonsense in there because um, I passed the PSM3. It's a horrible uh, test of your skill. It's very situational um, and very uh, objective or subjective, should I say, based upon uh, certain uh, teaching principles from scrum.org. Um, but, um, and I had to be, even I was coached to get through that. It's not an easy thing to do. You have to, you have to be able to answer it the way they want you to answer it. And there's a certain way that they expect, but the reality is this in the scrum guide, there's no such thing. And actually in scrum, there's no such thing. The, and there's some words here that, which it talks about in the team and this, the, you know, the scrum guide describes the scrum master as a servant leader for the scrum team. The scrum master helps those outside the scrum team understand which of their interactions with the scrum team are helpful and which aren't. The scrum master helps everyone change these interactions uh, to maximize the value created by the, excuse me, the scrum team. And it says on the development team, they're self-organizing. No one, not even the scrum master tells the development team how to turn product backlog into increments of potentially releasable functionality. Scrum recognizes no titles for development team members, regardless of the work being performed by the person. We're just team members. We have skills and capabilities. The senior title is made up by recruiters, HR departments, and others seeking a more senior profile. These are my words, by the way. And while there's nothing wrong with having a job title, an HR title, it's not relevant in the Scrum guide. And my purpose here was to test the knowledge of practitioners of Scrum as defined in the scrum guide. Um, so that was my purpose on that. And most people got that right. I don't think there's anything. Uh, <laughs> I can see people pinging Danielle. So if there's anything in the Q and a on the chat, just shout out to me folks and I'll, um, I'll, I'll pause, but I think everybody's pretty comfortable with that one. Okay, one of my favorite topics, estimation and velocity. And I think, and I'm just going to be very clear, I think estimation is brilliant. I think using points is a good thing if you use them correctly. And I think velocity is a very powerful measure. And I know that uh, the uh, Jeff side of the Scrum Guide would agree with me on this. And I'll clarify this and we'll pause and dig into this if we need to. A large majority, over 60%, got it right by saying we can use velocity to measure capacity, output, Output versus outcome, output and project trend. When are we going to deliver? Because if anybody thinks that companies will just let you say, well, we're going to do work, we don't know how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost, we're just going to do stuff and we'll let you know in the future, then you're deluded because organizations can't function like that. It is not a measure of speed or of team performance, even though the word velocity indicates time over distance. It's a bad word. It, I've had other people share with me it's not a good word for to be used, but that is the word we're stuck with. We should never use it to compare one team over another team. I do not agree with normalization of velocity. I do not agree with using points to earn time uh, interchangeably. I think they're incredibly bad practices. Um, I don't think you can normalize velocity across an organization for lots of reasons. Um, and it's nothing to do with delivering value. Points have no relationship to value. Some of the words I wrote on this, and I wrote a lot, I won't read the whole thing out, uh, but I will say that in the Scrum Guide, in the second paragraph on the screen, it says the input 
in sprint planning. The input to this meeting is the product backlog. The latest product increments, so what we've done so far, projected capacity of the development team during the sprint and past performance of the development team. Doesn't specify using anything and the word velocity doesn't appear. The number of items selected from the product backlog for the sprint is solely up to the development team. Only the development team can assess what it can accomplish over the upcoming sprint. And so velocity is derived. I'm, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. I'm pretty sure you all know all this. It's on the screen. You can scan through it yourselves. But velocity is clearly a measure of capacity, not speed or performance of one team over another. And it's not a measure of value. Lots of work, there's, there's lots of work or lots of points or lots of estimates do not equal lots of value. Um, I'm going to stop in case anybody's got any feedback on the whole estimate thing. I don't want to get into a major debate about points. And yeah, I can see yesterday's weather on there. So for people who are not familiar with that, the average of the last three sprints is the common way we measure yesterday's weather. You've got an actual velocity, you've got an average velocity, and when you've got team members out for one reason or other, you've got adjusted velocity. And there are ways to calculate this. Obviously, velocity is whatever the number is, the total of all points on completed work in a sprint. Completed, not almost done, nearly done, just about done except that last thing. That's not that's bad because that says we're okay to half-ass things and bring in partially completed work, get partial credits. So you sort of negate the value of using that as a technique. So basically, velocity is the, is the addition of all the points of completed work. Um, average velocity is over the last three sprints because it stops the large variations in the peaks and troughs happening across sprints. And adjusted velocity, very simply, if you've got if your team team members are down 20%, reduce your velocity by 20%. I've never found a better way to uh, achieve that. And it, remember, this is estimation; it's not precising. It's educated guessing. It's not being deadly accurate. Um, so do it. No, do I think estimating tasks is ineffective? It used to be recommended, but no. Um, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is bringing complete PBIs in. If you use user stories, which most people do, a user story delivers a piece of executable or usable value. A task does not. Once you start describing the how, we're talking about tasks. While we're still describing the what and the value and the customer then that's, that's going to deliver value. So we estimate at this level. The estimation of tasks is not advisable any longer or not recommended. It's not that it's not advisable, it's not recommended. The one thing you can't do, and, and I'm willing to let anybody take um, the co-host role here and explain how to do this, but if you've got, Pam. No, there was a question I was going to bring up. So you finish and I'll ask the question. Okay, I'm sorry. So the the other thing, and I can see the no estimates thing. I'll come in with that in a minute because no estimates is nonsense, FYI. And if there's people out there doing no estimates, I'll answer that why in a moment. But um, if you have uh, your stories estimated in points and your tasks estimated in hours, I've had scrum masters stand in front of me at interviews. I've had coaches stand in front of me at interviews. And I've said, show me how that works. So do me a burn down chart for the points or whatever you do. Show me how the points and the time thing works. And they always get tied in knots. They get into a complete mess. And the problem is you can't scale time. I think it's 142 hours in a week if you work 24-7. What do you do when you make do more hours than that? Travel forward in time or something? I don't know. I get confused on that one. So um, this is why points and time. You can't do that. Planning points were popularized by Ron Jeffries, uh, as far as I'm aware. And um, they, the whole point about uh, estimating in points is to avoid using time, to avoid using time. And if you go back to the 1940s and the original research on what became sort of more or less affinity estimation, relative sizing, it, was, it came out of the US military from the Rand Corporation in the 1940s, because even then, going on nearly 100 years ago, 80 odd years ago, they recognized we were pretty bad at estimating in time. And that's the origins of relative sizing. And then different methods of doing that have arisen since, since then. So if you want to use time, use time. You'll suck, but use time. If you want to use, if you're going to use points, use points, but don't mix them up. It's like oil and water, chalk and cheese. Um, I know. 
Yes. Nigel, there was a yeah. question that scrolled that asked, what do you do when uh, the devs are competing against how many points were done between teams and whatnot? What do you do about that? Okay, well, the first thing you could temporarily take away the whole points thing altogether. But the challenge is you've got to explain to people is that points, and this is one of the, I had a big argument with Andrew Long online about this. Now I really don't know why I couldn't explain this. Maybe it was just my bad, uh, the bias typing and things. Estimation, the scale of estimation is relative to the people doing the estimation. What you think is big, I might think is small. And neither of us are right or wrong. And that comes to a question that comes up about 21 being a big estimate. So the problem is that unless everybody in all the teams agree what all the numbers are, then there is no way to compare between teams. What you can do is compare trends. So is this team consistently increasing its velocity or increasing its capability its capacity because they're getting better at doing the work that's how the increase capacity that's how velocity increases are they flatlining so there's no continuous improvement they're just sort of treading along or are they declining the problem is when you start comparing trends it's not to go na na boo boo at the other team and say we're faster than you or we're, we're you're going down we're going up why are they going down what are we missing as practitioners what are we not spotting? These are weak signals. These are where we need to do some sense making and start understanding why is this team declining? Because they're probably being, um, you know, people are context switching and people are throwing in what we used to call hip pocket work. Managers have got their special bit of work in their hip pocket and they go, don't tell anybody, but I need you to do this before the sprint's over. And so their velocity is declining because they're doing unrecorded work, they're doing unplanned work. Or maybe they've got some. Uh, teaming challenges maybe there's people out or maybe there's some stress or tension in the team or maybe there's some technical issues we need to understand why this is happening and and i know i'm not saying what do i do about teams competing education they need to understand how this metric is used and what this metric means unless everybody thinks that this can is a five point can then the metrics between each team have no relevance to each other because they may think this can is five points, but then construction of this elaborate, this is real by the way behind me, the construction of this thing behind me, somebody else may think is five points. I may think this can is 105 points and I'm not wrong. And they're not wrong. The point is mm -hmm. that it's relative to the people doing the estimation. And somebody wrote in one of the comments online that if your estimation scale is five quintiles, quintillion points which sounds like a really big number then 21 is really really small but if your estimation scale starts at minus 50 then 21 is absolutely huge so this is the whole thing about relative sizing and in, as practitioners we have to explain to teams that measuring velocity is about measuring capacity relative to the people doing the estimation not relative to another team and this is why it gets a bad rap and people stop using it because you can, and I'm actually making a video at the moment, which I'm going to put out in line in the next week, in the, well, hopefully in the next few days, about large effort estimation, which Roger is an expert in and Pam's an expert in, where we use these techniques to estimate year-long initiatives with a 90% accuracy. And we use them for several years in Toyota. It works every time. And it's been used in, in many other companies now with Taught and, and other people who've used it. So these techniques are incredibly powerful, incredibly valuable, but we really have to teach them correctly and get rid of all the nonsense. Now, the no estimates thing. There's no such thing as no estimates. You have to count something. Whether you count the number of stories in a sprint or whether you're counting cycle time or lead time or something, you've got to measure something. If you're in a company that says, we'll do vague work in a vague time scale with a vague budget with some vague outcomes, you're blessed. Good luck to you and please give me a job. Because if you're in a company, they want to know how long something's going to take, how much something's going to cost, when can I expect something delivered, so you've got to measure something, folks. Hmm. The minute you measure something, guess what? You're estimating. 
So, and, and as I say, if you're in one of those rare businesses where it's just all random, then awesome, awesome source. Please give us all a job. Is there anything well, else? Well, Go ahead. Might be a good time to move on. Okay. Um, oh, Tim Dickey's joining. He's a nice guy. He's a good guy. So let me do it. All right, let's move on quickly because of things. So I'm going to go quickly through a couple of these because now I threw in a couple of questions which I didn't expect a lot of Scrum folks to know. These are not Scrum questions. I think Scrum people should understand them because if they understand the origins of Scrum, and both Jeff and Ken have been on record saying many times that Scrum is based on the Toyota production system and the empirical processes were learned at DuPont. And Jeff's further added on some of his uh, experiences in fighter aviation as uh, in things like the OODA loop and things. But predominantly, a lot of the teaching came out of the Toyota production system, the Toyota way, and what a lot of people call lean thinking, uh, which is slightly different, but it's okay for this conversation. So tact time. So a lot of people got this right. I was actually very, very impressed. Over half the people got this right. The average time needed in this context, the context in which I asked the question, is it's the average time needed per story to complete the sprint backlog in the planned time. Let me explain a little bit more. So it's a German word. It means rhythm. It's the white baton that an orchestra conductor uses called the tact baton. I did check with this with German speakers as well. And there may be some in the audience. It's not a scrum thing. I made that really, really clear. So tact time is a measure of customer demand rate or how fast the flow of our value stream should be in order to meet customer demand. Now, if you're a scrum practitioner, you should understand value streams. You should understand the concept of flow and value flow, one piece flow, these types of things. You should understand various different measurements like tact time, cycle time, and lead time. Um, so if you have 10 backlog items, or user stories, whatever you want to call them, that must be completed in a one-week sprint, five days. That means the tag time, the average amount of time you can spend on each item is half a day. This assumes a perfect process with no other interruptions, no other waste, and, and nothing else in there. Now, the time it takes to complete it is called its cycle time, and I'll come to that in a moment. This is another thing about estimating tasks as well. Customers don't buy tasks. They buy completed items, so stories, backlog items, features, functions, capabilities. We don't measure, um, so it's not a measure of task demand. So estimating tasks, why? Because we, don't, we can't plan all our tasks up front. We can't guarantee to know all the work we're going to need to do uh, on an item. That's why we have a daily scrum, a daily planning session, because work emerges, problems emerge, challenges emerge and learning emerges so we need to continuously replan and so estimating tasks have no value because it's no good going and say hey i completed a data model customers aren't going to get too excited there's a formula for tack time it's on the screen i'm going to distribute these slides to everybody who's attended i'll send that pdf link over eventbrite before i jump into any discussion on that i want to also cover um oh, i've got a cycle time one um just let me check. Has anybody got, because I'm I thought the cycle time one came next. Has anybody got any per, particular questions on tack time? Are we good there with was, the explanation? There was one, I guess it looks like just a yes or no question. Is that assuming this is from uh Cina? I don't know how to pronounce that, but okay. it's uh, so, yeah. is that is that assuming that the same skill level experience and equal selection uh, of the PBIs? No, it's nothing to do with the skills, the complexity of the PBI or anything else. And this is why estimating becomes really important and velocity and capacity planning becomes really important because your tight time is the average amount of time you've got. If you say it in a simpler way, let's say we've got uh, a 40 hour week and in a 40 hour week in a department, we have to process 40 sales contracts. The tag time, assuming a perfect process, is one hour per contract. That's your average time. Now, some contracts may take two or three hours. Other contracts may take 15 minutes. But the average time per item is that one divided by the other. So if you've got 10 backlog items and you've got five days to do them, you've got to do two per day. That's the average time. Now, some will take longer, some will take less. So if you've got a, an item that's, I don't know, small and an item that's a large and a large is three times if you like you know or medium large so 
twice as big, twice as big again, four times bigger. You can do that sort of capacity planning, but this is where velocity becomes really, really important. And actually, if you start to know that your sprint velocity, let's say, is 50 points a sprint. I've been on teams, by the way, that do 900 points a sprint. Depends on the numbers they're using and how many people are doing pulling work. So let's assume you've got 50 points in a sprint. You know that's your capacity. And so if somebody says, I've got these backlog items I need to deliver in the next sprint, and you know those backlog items are 70 points, you know your, tack time, your, your cycle time to meet that tack time, because the tack time would be whatever those number of stories are in a sprint. I've got people jumping in and out of the room here. So you're going to have to do the capacity planning. And there's two arguments there. If you want to do more in a sprint than your capacity allows, so if you have to meet a better tack time, because if there's more items in the same time, then you have to achieve a, a better tack time per individual item. So if you want to do that, you've got two levers you can pull. You either reduce the scope, obviously, to the, the, to the velocity of the team, or you've got to increase capacity. And that means longer working hours or another, another team, more capacity, not throwing more people, more bodies in one team, if you're familiar with Brooks Law and things of that nature. But you need to increase capacity. Now, typically what will happen is if you know your capacity, you can use, and if people don't want to use points, you see, and they want to use different measures, you can use tack time as a measure. And you can say, we know in an average sprint, we can get 10 stories done, or 10 backlog items, when they're all roughly the same size. So if we've now got 15 items roughly the same size we've got to get done in a sprint, we know we won't be able to achieve that. And there's no points here. Harry. Yes, uh, testing the audio. Mm. You're good. Yep. Good. We got good you. deal. Good deal. So you did get me on this question, and that's because I have a lean manufacturing background, and to me, tact is very specifically the cycle time to to create a unit. In fact, the baton you were talking about was our tact stick, our touch quality indicator, right? So, given the complexity of software development, I I, I was surprised to see the question here, to be honest with you. But it, to your point, you know, it, it is two different teams or, or two similar teams can look at the same piece of work, approach it differently. And to, to, to one of them, it might be moderately complicated to another. It might be simple. Yes. How as an engineer, this is my, my old mind, not as a scrum master, but as an engineer, how can I use tact to, to optimize the flow when all my teams are different? Does that question make sense? Yeah, it does make absolute sense. And the other problem is that all your work is different. You oh, yeah. see, from a manufacturing background, and I have, you know, a deep history <laughs> in lean and stuff, and my close friend in Belgium who's a deep expert in this and helps me out explaining some of this stuff, and bless him, that's Dirk for some of the people who know him. Um, in manufacturing, you've got standardized repeatable work. You don't have that in complex product development and software development. It's all different. It's all, you know, how big's big and how small is small. So That's why you threw me. I was like, wait a minute, what's happening? But, and the well, other problem is when we get to the cycle time question, you'll realize that tack time and cycle time are different. Mm -hmm. But in the early days, they were even described by Ono and Shingo as the same thing, which is what you were just talking about with the tack stick. Well, because tact is customer demand cycle time is, is, is flow rate, is the speed of flow. Somebody else chimed in there. Oh, please. yes. I was just going to say, like, speaking of tack time, uh, our tack time for these questions is, uh, we, we're, we're only on question number yeah. 10 here. So I we're going to go. Uh, we're going right, to accelerate because yeah. it will get us. We got to move. move. Yep. Sorry. Someone said we got to move. I believe. Okay. All right. Um, that was all right. Me. Oh, okay. Sorry, Pam. <laughs> so. Um, let's talk about the sprint goal. This is quite an easy one, uh, and we'll move fast through some of these. Uh, the Scrum Guide says, answer E, a lot of people got this. I'm surprised how many people didn't get it, and I worry about people making commitments to deliver backlog and the expected outcomes with management and principles and objectives that we adhere to. This sounds pretty horrible. A process that enables the team to achieve some value for the company. Uh, th this is just showing a a lack of familiarity with the scrum guide and the purpose of a sprint goal. And the scrum guide says an objective set for the sprint that can be met through the implementation of product backlog. 
There's a lot of words there. I'm not going to read them out, um, which basically confirms that um, the second line on the screen on the second block is it says the sprint goal is an objective set for the team and that can be met through the implementation of product backlog. It provides guidance to the development team on why it's building the increment and it, it is created during the sprint planning meeting, which is amusing because they use the word meeting. And I've told Dave West about this, bless him if he ever listens to this, that there are words like meeting in there when they say sprint planning is an event. We need to fix that. I'm going to keep going unless anybody stops me because I want to cover cycle time for Harry's sanity. So cycle time in, my, in the context of this question, and I'm going to put my hands up and say, I asked this in a, I, the answer I gave you was a poor answer. And, and I apologize for that. In the context of the question, it is correct, but I'm going to explain the, 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 the challenge with that in a moment. So cycle time in this context is the time taken to complete a step in a process. And I'm gonna go on to the next screen. And I did, I've got yards of text. I've got two slides on this and I'm not gonna read it all out verbatim, but I want to give some context around this and why tact and, and cycle are different. So as the top line says, oh no, use tact and he misspelled it as T-A-C-T synonymously with cycle time, which confuses many, many people. And, and that's where Harry was coming from. In some of the books, and I've given some book references there, Ono describes it as the time it should take to manufacture a single item. So one user story, if you want the equivalent of one PBI, not a task, an actual item. Um, and then they go on to define customer demand, what we now understand as tact. In the book on TPS, the famous Toyota production system book on there, he describes it in lots of different words, but basically uh, he says in TPS book in which one unit is to be made. And then in his book on, in the Kanban book written by the Japan, Japanese Management Association, it says the term cycle time refers to the time frame of so many minutes and so many seconds to produce a unit or a piece of a product. Shingo's book on TPS, and they're all on my bookshelf here, goes on again, spe spelling it incorrectly. And, and Ritzo Shingo, Shigeo Shingo's son, is a close friend of mine. So I check a lot of this stuff with him. He says, tag time is the time ta it takes, it is, it's my typo there, the time it takes to produce one piece of a product. And I said, the profession, and I've had this conversation with, with Steve at Scrum Org and others, and we have a continuous conversation. The problem with professional scrum with Kanban, it doesn't differentiate cycle time. It just calls everything cycle time. And that's where there's a lot of confusion comes in. Comes in. So tag time measures demand. Cycle time measures performance against demand. So tag time is what you have to meet or achieve. Cycle time is what you're actually achieving. And your cycle time needs to be lower than your tack time to meet the customer demand. Now, this is very easy in manufacturing, much harder in software. We can break this down a little further. So this is where I should have been a little fairer to people. And, and again, I'll take, I'll take the, my own self-criticism as well as anybody else's on this question. So we break down cycle time into process time. So processing time is the time taken measure from taking one product or item from your backlog before the process we're about to do. So we take something, let's say we take something out of the, if you've got a Kanban sort of flow and you go design development testing, let's just say you do that. You take something from design to take into development and then when you're finished, you'll put it in testing, the queue for testing. So in that flow, the minute you pull from design to the moment you push into testing, that's your processing time. So if you like, it's the cycle time of the development piece of work. We call that processing time. It's a measure of the duration of that piece of work, but it's part of the overall lead time, which is then this product lead time and customer lead time. So lead time to get the product ready for shipping, customer lead time, which is when the customer receives it from when they place the order. So cycle time is the time between two consecutive products leaving the process. So when you measure a continuous flow, you can now measure that cycle time that's occurring. So in manufacturing, this is really easy to measure. Now, I can go a lot deeper into this. We don't have the time. 
I do have a document I wrote about this explaining in depth and I will share it with the people I share the slides with from this evening's conversation on this because this is something I think if you're going to use professional scrum with Kanban or any other methodologies that use the Kanban tool and Kanban is a tool not a methodology read a post on that I wrote then you are going to need to understand tack time cycle time process time product lead time customer lead time overall lead time and process cycle efficiency and if you want to start using new metrics which are about calculating flow and value using these metrics the formulas are in the document i'll send after this call with all the slides that go along with it is harry still there or did he run off somewhere did I lose him? I think I lost him. We went, he, no, he's, he's here. here. He's here. I, I'm here. I'm listening and I, I really appreciate it. I put it on the comments. Uh, okay. That was driving me a little bonkers and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Nigel. No, absolutely. And, and that was the one thing I read when I read back and I went, Nigel, you could have, could have put a, 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 an easier one for that. So let's move on and get back into scrum stuff. So who should estimate work? This is really simple. The people who plan the work, do the work. The people who do the work, estimate the work. It's, it's, it's a, a simple, you can't have people outside the team. I've worked in lots of organizations or coached in them where the tech lead and the product owner do the initial estimate and then the team do something else. I don't know how that's supposed to work. Um, and uh, people determine how big epics are before they give them to a team. And I'm like, and just so you know, every epic is the story of another epic. I got that off Jeff Sutherland. Um, and I don't really care whether you call them features uh, whatever you call it, whatever you want to break these things down in, they're just backlog items of different size. Uh, the bit in the scrum guide where it says this, it says here, the guide says the development team is responsible for all estimates. The product owner may influence the development team by helping it understand and select trade-offs, but the people who will perform the work make the final estimate. And it goes on to say development teams are cross-functional with all the skills as a team necessary to create a product backlog increment. If anybody wants to stop, just shout out. If not, I'm just going to get through a couple of these basic ones because they're not uh, that uh, uh, controversial, I don't think. A scrum master is uh, a team coach, question mark. Um, it amused me when people said only if we don't have scrum or agile coaches. Um, and they said the team is self-coaching, -co well, self-organizing. Um, and um, management is supposed to coach the team. I'd really, really love management to become coaches and problem solvers. And, and the clue in the last one, the scrum master leads the team. There's no leading here. Uh, they're serving the needs of the team and supporting and coaching the team. Most people got this right. The scrum, scrum guide very basically says the scrum master serves the development team in several ways, including coaching the development team and it goes on to use other words that suggest they help support guide and finally coach the development team in organizational environments so it's really clear the scrum master is a coaching role now we get into this sort of delivery management thing and some of the criticisms i have of some companies who turn scrum masters into delivery managers my answer to them if you want delivery managers hire delivery managers don't do scrum it's okay if you want a delivery deliv delivery driven a push organization rather than a pull organization uh, scrum masters should also act as delivery managers ensuring the team deliver a lot of people were answering these other questions a few people said delivery management's important so yes it's in their role um, it's not in the scrum guide apparently um, <laughs> only when the team are consistently failing to meet their commitments so the scrum masters must beat the team when they do not perform or take away their I don't know their snacks or their coffee or something and refuse to let them eat lunch um, so of course the scrum guide goes on to say uh, uh, they are self-organizing no one not even the scrum master tells the development team how to turn product backlog into increments of potentially releasable functionality. This is about what we call leader's intent. This is about trust. The product owner with the organization has made clear what the intent is through helping formulate a sprint goal and talking about the backlog and talking about the needs and desires of the company. And the urgency is expressed in the prioritization of the backlog. 
and the development team give intent that they will use all their best knowledge and ability to be able to deliver the expected outcome. This is a trust-based, intent-based leadership model. A definition for a delivery manager from the web says, uh, facilitates the timely production of software and other computer products through the effective management of team members and work schedules. These are not things Scrum Masters do. Um, I'm going to bang through two or three of these, then I'll pause again. And if you've got questions on them, please put them in the chat and, and have them ready. So I asked if a burn up chart is mandatory for Scrum teams. I use burn up rather than burn down because everybody uses burn downs, including me. Uh, I could have put cumulative flow, that may have confused a few folks. Um, most people got this right saying false. Um, there is no uh, visualization prescription or rule in the scrum guide there's no rule that says you must use this versus that um, it's a good technique um, I was amused by 29 people here that said all of the above not if anybody understands quantum mechanics uh, but they said what they had true and false so that's when you're both a one and a zero you're both uh, in this place and that place at the same time so 29 people thought you could be true and false at the same time. There's another example of that later on. Um, so basically it's false. Uh, the guide from the guide, it says various project projective practices upon trending have been used to forecast progress like burn downs, burn ups or cumulative flows. These have, these have proven useful. However, these do not replace the importance of empiricism in complex environments. What, will happen is unknown. Only what has already happened may be used for forward-looking decision-making. And because I, I said put 27, it was 29 actually in the resort I took today. So uh, the quantum mechanics thing or quantum physics or whatever that complex science is seem to put, have a, 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 a thing to play there. I'm gonna just stop at this point because we're gonna get into value-based questions. Um, so any, no, the coat, that's Schrodinger's cat, exactly. Okay, people, people are along with this. So I'm reading, um, okay, people are saying beer breaks lead to bathroom breaks. Um, are you trying to tell me something, James? Oh, no, there was just some jokes about, uh, like, if the developers are bad, then, you know, take away their bathroom breaks. And then it was take, take away their beer breaks. I just made the comment that one leads to the other. That was about it. There's no, I th no, I think no huge should, questions thus far. I think you should make them work in their underwear and then steal the clothes and then that way they can never leave, you know? I don't know. Maybe that's not politically <laughs> Pam's already lost it. Sorry, Pam. Yeah, moving on, she's Come saying, on. keep going. Um, on. Yeah. Okay, I'm moving on. I'm English. It's a, it's a thing. So let's talk about this. This really drove some people nuts online. And, and I had a real humdinger of a, a, a to and fro with one person. And um, so what is not, not a measure of value? What is not a way to measure value? Now, if anybody's a Lean Six Sigma practitioner, these definitions come from that world. These are industry definitions. They are in the literature. They've been there for years. So, um, and the correct answer is any th an activity that fixes defects for the product or service being processed is not a measure of value. And somebody said, well, how can an activity be a measure of value? So I responded, imagine you've got somebody painting your house and every 15 minutes they sit down for 10 minutes to admire their work, but you're paying them on time. I'm pretty sure you'll decide that the activity of sitting down and admiring their work is not a measurement of value. You'll be measuring their value based on their activity they're delivering. So therefore that activity of sitting down isn't valuable. Therefore we can use activity as a measure of value. I did not define these. These are defined by the industry. This is a little bit more uh, information on that. Just so people know, a lot of people talk about zero defects. The actual correct phrase in Toyota is zero defects accepted. Defects happen, they occur, it's a reality but we don't accept them. We will never move work to the next process. And it's rule number five in the Toyota production system. You go read Ono's book. We never send uh, a, anything defective to a subsequent process. So we don't accept any defects. We eliminate them before moving on. 
but the industry defines value or value added processing as adding value to the product or service that the customer cares or is willing to pay for it. It physically changes the product or service by being processed. The work being done is adding value. It's done right the first time with no rework because if you're going to do rework, you're not adding new value. You're just fixing what we didn't do right the first time. It's waste, rework, defects. The word defects is one of the seven wastes that Ono defined. And then value added activities or non value added activity, I apologize, is split between two definitions and mood of the Japanese word for waste. And there's a definition there from a lady who's a real Japanese expert who, who helps me out quite a little bit online giving the definitions of more meaning because mood doesn't just mean rubbish or waste. It's all about making effort in vain, wasted effort, unnecessary effort, and spending of money. And we shouldn't just eliminate the waste to help the company make more money or have more money left because we want everybody who's engaged in the value creating process should have more left. And that was her explanation. She's a Japanese language expert. Um, but type one waste or type one mood is non value added activities, which are essential. So until we can get rid of regulation and other, and other business conditions or technical limitations, there are some things we have to do. And SOX compliance is an example I often use. It adds no value to the product, but we have to do it because people like Enron and other bad people who commit corporate fraud. Uh, it's like cybersecurity. It adds no value to your product. I tell you for a fact it doesn't, but it costs us a bunch of money and we have to do it because bad actors. And type two are uh, non-value added activities which can be eliminated immediately. Red tape, bureaucracy, unnecessary meetings. This, these are industry definitions. So any, the, the, the previous, uh, I think the uh, previous thing said that, um, well, let me go back for some reason, but the previous uh, answer was uh, doing work on defects isn't adding value. Now, we'll come back. Well, I'll, I'll drop out into questions in a moment. So the product owner, so I asked a question, a product owner team is better in large organizations. And the reason I ask this is because this is something that happens quite frequently in organizations and you end up with product owners being a committee. And so the answer is false. Uh, and I threw in a few red herrings there just, just for the hell of it. And, uh, and so the debrief on this is the guy, the product owner, guy, sorry, the, the scrum guide says the product owner is one person, not a committee. The product owner may represent the desires of a committee in the product backlog, but those wanting to change a product backlog items priority must address the product owner. And in training, I often say, you know, I ask, I use Kahoot and I ask some quiz questions. Uh, and I usually have the CEO as one of the responses because people think the CEO can override the product owner. Technically, yes, they're the boss of the company and, and one is going to, to listen to the CEO. But ultimately, the CEO should influence the product owner, not overrule the product owner in a really good company. Um, and so I went on as a few other words that, um, uh, that uh, talk about uh, having a product owner uh, support network. We used to call this the office of the product owner, where the product owner will consult experts and people to help them. But ultimately, the product owner is a single person. One more, and then we'll jump back into the, uh, to the uh, Q&A. So a definition of done applies to, and we read down the list, uh, about a third, yeah, just over a third of the people said a single product. One of, some of these answers really worry me because the definition of done is a key artifact in Scrum. It's one that they talk about a great deal. And then when we say the organization, a definition of done applies to the organization and aligns to their mission statement, the goal of a business division, uh, a team focus ensuring we meet the scrum values. So the scrum, the sprint goal then will not, so the definition of done won't change ever because it just means we're going to meet the scrum values. So let's have a look what the scrum guide says. Any one product or system, any one product or system should have a definition of done that is standard for any work done on it. 
Um, and so I, I wrote, I'm sorry, but I wrote, it's clear a lot of people have no idea what the definition of done is. And this is a key tenant. It's a, a key artifact in Scrum and it's essential to understand it. And the guide goes on to say, if done for an increment is not a convention of the development organization, the development team of the Scrum or uh, of the Scrum team must define a definition of done. So if there isn't one provided or there isn't a convention for the development organization, the team must create one appropriate, appropriate for the product. And where there's multiple scrum teams working on the system or product release, the development teams on all the scrum teams must mutually define the definition of done. So if you're re working in a, let me just drop that back to the cameras. If we're um, working in a scaled organization, then what we should be doing, oh, somebody's in Belgium at 3.30 in the morning, no, go to bed. It'll be on video. You'll be able to record this. And I'm, I'm seeing that, uh, oh, I remember. So please watch the video. Go to bed, sleep. Um, but um, if you're working in a multi-team system, uh, or in a, well, you call it Scrum at Scale Safe, whatever you want to call it, whatever your multi-team system is that you're using as a scaling approach, Ask yourself, do you have a definition of done that aligns all the teams to what done looks like on a combined increment? Do you have a sprint goal which aligns all the teams on the done increment for the scaled organization? We call that a distal goal. The, the sprint goal close to a single team is known as a proximal goal. So one of the uh, changes I'm proposing, some of the things we've talked about a lot in multi-team systems in team science, is that uh, in a large scaled organization doing Scrum or some agile approach, we should have the concept of a distal goal. That means every sprint, there should be the scaled goal that all the teams are aligning to, and they should also have their proximal goal, which is what they need to achieve to complete their piece of the overall puzzle. Um, uh, I'm seeing Harry asking a question about team maturity. Go ahead, sir. Uh, well, actually, it has to do with the definition of done. I've worked yes. in a couple of organizations where <sighs> definition of done was kind of used as a club on a per team basis by management. Every team had to have their definition of done, but they weren't allowed to change when the project shifted. Granted, most of these teams were doing maintenance type work, right? But it, it became a stale artifact that nobody looked at. Does that make sense? And as a, as a practitioner, yeah that's what you don't want. You know, you, you want people to have agreement. You want people to, to move forward. How would you address that kind of situation where you know, it's clearly not a good thought? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, it does. I mean, people, the thing we struggle about, and this is why practitioners have a struggle, and this is why scrum masters struggle and coaches and, and practitioners from, and from our industry struggle, is because organizations say they want to do this thing, whether it's Scrum or some agile approach, or you know, we want to become agile and we want to be 80% agile in six months. And what the hell does that mean? Um, we've all got Kanban boards, so we're agile. Um, we do daily stand ups, so we're agile, you know, this sort of nonsense. Um, but when you actually really explain what it means, organizations push back. It's the famous phrase from. Peter Drucker, any innovation in a corporation will stimulate the corporate immune system to create antibodies to destroy it. So the whole point is it's pushing back. And so what we've really got to do is we've got to explain the value and the benefit of these artifacts and the reason we use them. And, but the reality of it is these organizations, which we will eventually not succeed in or won't listen to us, uh, and I'm reading what Danielle's writing about safety and compliance. It's just lip service. Yeah. Boeing 737 Max is an example of that. And the, and the chaos around see Tim. <laughs> I mean, Tim's a safety guy anyway. So I can see, you know, uh, but it, anyway, let's move on. Um, all right. I'm going to jump in. We're going to, we've got time to get the rest of this done if we move rapidly. So, uh, the scrum values are, it's a dead simple one. They are what they are, whether you like them or not, whether you think the platitudes are nonsense, we can debate another time. But the scrum values are really, really clear. The problem is with this for scrum practitioners, and, and, and Pam will tell you, she's been interviewing scrum masters and, and they get rejected because some of the interviewers ask them about the, the values and what they mean and they can't articulate them and explain them. 
if you do any scrum org class, the scrum values are very uh, front and foremost in, especially in the, the foundational courses like PSM1. They are a key tenant of scrum. They are considered very important. The last scrum guide, they brought them to the front of the scrum guide and made them uh, very, very uh, sort of a, a focal point and something that's very important. So, I mean, Scrum goes on to talk about living in these values. The problem with values is in all the core companies, companies have values, Scrum has values, Agile has values and principles, Lean has values, the Toyota Way is a bunch of values and principles and things. So you get overwhelmed with all these and they become platitudes, which means they end up on wallpaper. They sound great, but they don't actually translate into anything. Uh, and what Scrum, especially Scrum.org, try to do is to try and make the values meaningful in all the aspects of Scrum. So it was a simple, do you know it or don't, or don't you know it? And not knowing it, I can tell you now, for people who end up watching this video, it is costing you jobs at interview. And I can tell you that because I know people who are asking the questions, you're getting them wrong and you're not getting the roles. Um, this was a simple true false. We'll move straight past it. Big, big projects require a bigger scrum team. It's false. Uh, size of the project isn't related to the size of the team. I put a few words about if you want to deliver faster, you need to increase capacity. Uh, so you'd add an additional team perhaps. Uh, but we don't need to necessarily, there's no rule saying big project needs big team. This is a great one, a really contentious one. The word ready was added, or uh, the, the story goes, the word ready was added by Jeff because he wanted the concept of ready in the Scrum Guide, but there is no definition of ready in the Scrum Guide. The word ready is mentioned one time in capitalization. Um, a lot of people got that right. Um, and it's in the, in the product, product backlog in the Scrum Guide. It says product backlog items that can be done by the development team within one sprint are deemed ready for selection, and it's not even capitalized, ready for selection in, a, in sprint planning. Product backlog items usually acquire this degree of transparency through the above described refining activities. So the definition of ready is something I use. I think it's great. I think it's very valuable and useful. Some people see it as a stage gate and unnecessary. Um, it's not recognized as a thing, as an artifact by the scrum guide. There's been a lot of debate about that over the years. I've used it to great utility and great effect. Uh, if you've got any comments or questions, stick them in the chat. We'll come back to them. I'm conscious of time, so I want to get through some of these questions, and then we can look at the final comments. Now, there's three questions here back to back about accountability. Accountability, the word accountable appears one time in the Scrum Guide. I did a word search on it once, it appears. So it's, the question was, the Scrum Master is accountable for the deliverables of the development team. 82% said false, that's perfect because that's the right answer. 70% said not. The team is self-organizing. No one, not even the scrum master, tells the dev team how to turn, blah, blah, blah. And therefore, the scrum team cannot be accountable. The scrum master, should I say, cannot be accountable for the deliverables. The development team are accountable for their own deliverables because they define their own work. Second question in this set, was the product owners accountable for the deliverables of the development team? Again, it's false. Um, a third of people think it was true, which is worrying. The Scrum Guide, again, just to repeat, says no one, not even the Scrum Master, tells the dev team, etc. The third one in this set is the product owner is accountable for value delivered by the team. Bingo. This is the magical one. This is separating work from value. And the majority of people got this right, which was amusing because a larger number got it wrong on the previous questions. So it's an interesting statistic. Uh, and there's a lot of words that say that, but, um, but the product owner is responsible for maximizing value of the product resulting from the work of the development team. How this is done may vary widely across blah, blah, blah. Lots of words here. And after it defines the product owner's role, it says the product owner may do the above work or have the development team do it. However, the product owner remains accountable. Value, accountable. I actually don't like this last line in the Scrum Guide because it basically says the product owner can cast off all the role. We've defined this role for the product owner. And now we've said the product owner can delegate it all to the development team where we really want the development team doing something called development and creating value. And now the product owner is going, yeah, you guys do it. And, and that 
does tend to breed some bad practice. That's an opinion of mine. Um, all right, let me just stop there briefly. Um, we're going to be we're going to be just on time, so we're going to get things to be done. I can see one or two people about to drop. Um, any questions on that, or shall I just rattle through the rest? Good, Tim. Everybody good? All right. I think we're all pretty much aligned to these things, and we know where we're going. So velocity is best calculated using t-shirt sizing. Thankfully, nearly everybody said false. It's completely right. T-shirt sizing, although it's known as affinity estimation, really, really good. There's some words in the Scrum Guide. You'll get those in the handout, um, and I'll leave them on the screen for a few seconds, then people are stopping the video in the future can read them. Now, the one that caused huge controversy. A story bigger than 21 points is too big. Now, I debriefed this a lot earlier on. It was a 50-50 split between the two. How big is big? How small is small? Size is relative. I put a lot of words into this, which is basically what I talked about earlier, the original research in the 40s from the Rand Corporation and what's known as the Delphi technique about relative sizing. Um, and basically, the key is... It's for the team to decide on the scale they use, if at all any scale is used. Estimation and estimation techniques are specific to the team, and any scales are relative to those doing the estimation. Nobody outside of the team can tell them they're using too big or too small a numbers, or the scale of estimation isn't appropriate. Um, I'll see things popping up, but I'll come back to that in a moment. I want to finish the last couple of questions off, and that will give us... 10 minutes for some final discussion. Waterfall project management is still useful. Of course it is. If you know anything about the, the Kinevin uh, framework and the, the five domains of Kinevin, if you're in the uh, clear or complicated side of the Kinevin framework, as it's now known, the, the difference between clear and complicated is a simple definition. Complicated needs experts, clear does not. But if you're in a linear predictable, ordered system, waterfall project management works beautifully. If you're in a non-linear, unordered uh, system, then an un unpredictable system, you need an empirical technique to work in there, and Scrum will work in some of those contexts. Which brings us to, and there's a lot of words in there that describe all of that, um, and these will be available for the handouts. And for those watching the video, I'll put a link in the YouTube description so you can download the uh, the handout for this so you've got the whole debrief and so this was interesting because then i said complex product development requires scrum because i just sort of said in Kinevin, if you're in the chaotic or complexity or the complexity side the unordered uh, unpredictable non-linear side you need something that works on an empirical basis but there's lots of things other than scrum and Scrum actually works in the liminal area, the sort of boundary between the sort of ordered and unordered worlds. It doesn't work hard, hard left in the unordered worlds for different reasons. And there are other tools there to assist with that. So there was a, a reasonable split here. You know, a good 40% of people thought you must use Scrum. That's not true. There's lots of other ways to do it. Scrum is useful. Um, and then... The uh, last couple of ones, the increment must be in a usable condition at the end of the sprint. The answer is true. Most people got that because in the Scrum Guide, it says the increment must be in usable condition regardless of whether the product owner decides to release it. So these are really, do you know the Scrum Guide? Do you know what it says? It's yes or no. It's a test of your knowledge of the Scrum Guide. It's not a test of whether or not you are applying this effectively in your work and, and that's much harder to test. That was the last run of questions. We got 15 minutes if we need to use them for any final questions and discussion. Um, anyone got planning poker cards? I'm trying to figure out what that comment was. So um, James, Pam, what have we noticed? Uh, in the chat? Yeah. Um. There was to in multiple teams scrum. Uh, one question was in multiple teams scrum. Don't each of these teams also have their own? Oh, never mind. That's for the definition of done. Okay. Actually, that makes me think of a comment because one of the things that I get asked a lot in training, and I've proven this so many times over, and we've done it in the real world in real companies, and Toyota being one of them, is that when you've got say you've got five teams. And they're all working in a scaled organization on one product. 
shouldn't all five teams use exactly a normalized estimation scale? So we all agree what two points is, three points, five points, whatever the, whatever the scale is, whatever the, the sizes of dogs or fruit or whatever we're using, yeah? And the answer is no. Because if you start doing that as a pattern, what happens when you've got 500 people working on a project? 2,000 people working on a project. How the hell are you going to normalize that? And that's where I object with save gets into this one point equals, I don't know, half a developer day, or I don't know what nonsense they're talking about now. But basically, there's been all these different arguments about normalizing points into some time scale, but then you've just broken the cardinal rule is don't estimate in time because we know we're very bad at it. And the research is then, I'll send out the notes with this, uh, the video and the slides and things. So the way I teach this and the way we've done it is every team has its own scale, which is really good. Because let's say you, give, you take a bunch of work in a big, big old backlog refinement session, and I have no, no problem with big room planning as a concept. So we can get a bunch of people in a room and do a whole bunch of backlog refinement, a bunch of teams. And if you use less, if people know large scale scrum, what will happen is there'll be a bunch of backlog items chucked out in part one of sprint planning and in part two the and, they, and somebody from each of the teams will take some of that backlog and take it back to the teams then they'll further refine them in in uh, part two of sprint planning or further planning part two so let's just assume you get a bunch of people in a room and you go to a bunch of uh get a bunch of work and people take chunks of that work into their individual teams now those teams start discussing it refining it and start estimating it using whatever level of nonsense they want to use Good so far. And I have some good slides on this. I may chuck them in this deck to show this. So everybody's now got an estimate of size of some scale. Let's say we're using numbers, you know, just so we have a nice, easy value. Just take the total estimate from each team and aggregate them, add them together. You now have a total number. But you say they're all based on different nonsense, Nigel. How can this number be meaningful? But when they start executing and recording their velocity, their velocity is relative to their estimation scale. So if I use really big numbers, my velocity will be really big. If I use really small numbers, my velocity number will be much smaller. So if I aggregate all the estimates and then I aggregate all the velocities each sprint and burn one from the other, it will burn correctly. What you can then start doing, if you're really good as a practitioner, you can start saying, well, if this team's estimate is 500 points and the velocity is 50 points, they're going to get done in 10 sprints. But if this team's velocity, uh, so this team's estimate is 1,000 points and they're only executing at 10 points a sprint, boy, that's going to take a lot longer than this team. So now you can start looking at how you can redistribute work across the teams by saying, we need teams, we need you to pull something from one of the other teams. And in Lean, this is called workflow leveling or high junker. We're leveling the workflow. So we're balancing the workflow. When that work is pulled into another team, it must be re-estimated using their level or scale of estimation. And then we re-aggregate both the, the new estim overall estimate and of course the velocity number. This is how I've done it for years. And Pam's done it when she's worked with me in Toyota. Uh, Roger, if he's still hanging out in the hidden behind the scenes somewhere, these people have used this technique and it works and it works without fail. Where the challenge comes is you get teams accelerating away and nobody balances the workload. And then everybody's waiting for the long tent in the pole and they're all pointing at that team and saying, yeah, you're crappy, you're slow. And that's where you get those bad practices coming in. So what we need to be using is velocity for trend analysis and for identifying opportunities to level the workflow. And if you get back into the tack time cycle time discussion, there's a chart called a Yamazumi chart which draws a line, it's from manufacturing, it draws a line, it, it, makes, it basically means scaled bar chart, but it's a Yamazumi chart. And if your sprint boundary is the line, all the teams need to complete all the work in the sprint to meet the tact time of that sprint. And if you see one team, because their velocity number and their estimates is over the line, it shows you need to balance or level the workflow because you need to get everybody below that line of tact. And that's where you got the opportunity for people to pull stories from other teams to balance the workload. You start to see where the lean practices now start to cross into the scrum and the agile world and where you start to need to use these practices in scaled teams or multi-team systems if you truly want to be able to deliver effectively. And I'm sorry, but some of these scaling frameworks, approaches 
have no clue how to do this. Uh, and this is where we're, we're starting to struggle at a scaled level. Oh, Daniel wants a funny group picture. They've nearly all gone away, Daniel. You could have done the funny group picture while we're all talking. Um, let me see if I can just... No, we got to like, we got to do something funny. Oh, you mean you want people to be, make gestures and things? Well, there's half, half the screen isn't there, but... It all might right, be good I'm for a thumbnail. I'm just saying. Hey, huh? hey, hey, Nigel, I have a question. This is Ritesh. Yes. Here. Yes. Yeah, so, so if we have like five Scrum teams working on a product, should each of these Scrum teams also have their own definition of done? So you need a definition of done, which makes the combined uh, work of all, if all those teams are working on the same product, then there should be a definition of done, which applies to the combined work of all the teams. That's what the Scrum guide defines now. This is where I step away from the, let the scrum guide and say, in practice, what we've had is teams have their own definition of done, which may talk about how they test things, how they prove that things have met quality metrics and various other things specific to the team. But then when we combine, when that work is being combined with the work of other teams, there's a definition of done for the product. So strictly speaking, the definition of done is for the product, not for the team. But there are good practices that enable a team to have some predetermined definitions that say, for every piece of work we do, we want to make sure it meets certain criteria because we're more comfortable that we've met the quality standards and various other standards that the team have set for that. But remember, the definition of done is for a product, not for a team. Does that okay. help? Yes, it does, but it raises some more questions because I'm just wondering that what happens in the sprint review in that case, because is the product owner doing a sprint review of the, the increment, which is developed by all of these five teams together. And let's say there are more teams there. Are, what about 10 teams, 15 teams? Yes. So one thing, Nigel, if I may, uh, one yes. thing that I've seen done, Sina, is uh, just what you said, you have an, uh, uh, you have the project definition of done that everybody adheres to, but the database guys have to have their own definition for the data work that the front end guys might not need. However, they all have to meet the core definition, the core definition of quality, the core definition of delivery. There's going to be some data specific stuff that those dudes absolutely have to have that is meaningless to the mid tier front end UX, d depending on how the, the structure set up. And in fact, the more complex you make it, the more critical it is to have that core, what, what are we achieving here for this product, right? And I've seen that done at, at a mid-sized corporation and, and it worked actually really, really well. So that's all I got. Uh, and I, I actually think all that uh, is extremely valid, Harry. I mean, and this is where you, get, you step beyond the teaching and understanding and start to say, okay, in my context, what tools, methods, techniques, and approaches fit my context best? And one of the questions I was going to throw in there, and I didn't, is, um, you know, when, it, when does Scrum doesn't apply? And, you know, and I use the, 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 the amusing comment of in the, in the operating room. And, yeah, I saw that, Danielle. Yes, common sense reigns. But um, the, the thing is this, Scrum doesn't always apply. There are techniques in Scrum which can be used in isolation now, According to Scrum, that's not Scrum. And I'd agree. If you say you're doing Scrum, do Scrum. But there's nothing wrong with using practices and principles and ideas from Scrum and not calling it Scrum. That's okay. We do that all the time in everything else we do. Um, and uh, so it's okay to do that. I'm just watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, common sense should be considered a superpower. You don't say. So... The other thing to really bear in mind here is context is key. If you're serving in the armed forces, that's very different than if you're running frontline patient care in a hospital in an ER. That's a dumb sight different than if you're developing software for a car or if you're building a car. And it's different again if you're drilling for oil. All these companies may use a lot of the principles and ideas and the teachings and techniques from the lean world, the Toyota world, the agile world, design thinking, blah, 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 all these different things. But it doesn't mean to say that what works, this is why case studies and case-based studies don't really work or aren't really that valuable. Case studies are a great celebration of a success 
in this context for this company. But just because you say, well, it worked really, really good. Deloitte did this really fantastic thing in this great big Fortune 100 company. It'll work in our hospital. No, it won't. Because it's a completely different context. If you go to different countries, I've worked, I don't know if Javier's still hanging out somewhere, I've worked quite a bit in Puerto Rico. Let me tell you, the context there is very different than if I'm working in downtown Texas. And I'm pretty sure that if we're working in Delhi or Bangalore, it's going to be a different context than if I'm working in Tokyo. Uh, because we've got language and culture and behaviors and different traditions. And so certain things have to adapt into those different contexts. And then when you bring in different products and services and different business contexts, different lifestyle contexts, all these things uh, need different attention. So context is absolutely critical. And my focus now, if you want, that's two or three minutes, my focus is the flow of value. This thing behind me, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, it's not relevant, but my focus is now on how do we develop the flow of value. And if what we're doing isn't for value, I don't know why we're bothering, number one. And the reality of it is, is that value is only valuable if the value is valued. And, they, and if you want to know what your value is, ask the person who perceives value in what you do because they're typically called a customer. Stakeholders may, you may call a customer a stakeholder, but I don't like that always as a definition because the difference between a customer and a stakeholder is a stakeholder has an opinion about what you do and may affect what you do. A customer pays you money. They're your source of revenue. A user is a consumer of what you do, but pays you no money for it, okay? So a customer pays you money. So. What we're really saying is customer first, and that's the sort of tag word for Toyota since 1946, it's the founding principle. So we're focused on delivering value to the people who consume value. And so what we're gonna do is work in organizational design. When you apply Scrum or agile techniques, design thinking, or any of these other techniques you may be aware of or work within, or plain old project management, if we're talking about organizational design. We're designing an organization optimized to deliver the flow of value to somebody who gives you money or somebody who perceives value in what you do. If you're a charity, then the perception of value is different than if you're making an iPhone or something of this nature. So my focus now is in what, what are the tools, techniques, methods, and approaches that best work in your context to optimize the flow of getting value to the customer. And if you're big Fortune 100 or big, you know, big, uh, Uber Corp uh, uh, ex uh, a corporation or uh, organization, there's two things you care about. Growth going up, cost coming down. And the only way you're going to transform that is by changing behaviors through the design of the organization and your culture is a product of your behaviors. If you smoke and drink and swear and fight, that's a different culture than if you're peaceable, respectful, work with each other, team together, communicate well. So your culture is a product. You don't change culture, you change behaviors by creating methods, techniques, approaches that people can follow so they behave differently, they act differently, and the culture will emerge. And we wanna get the right balance to deliver value to a customer. I'm gonna start, we're just two minutes out. We've done very well on time box. Number one, I hope it's been useful. Um, I want to give the, the floor for the last 30 seconds, last minute or two to anybody who wants to tell me I'm full of it or ask me a question or make a statement. And um, the Nawaz is saying, uh, how can we bring Toyota factory structure to an organization? Let me just tell you something about copying Toyota. You can't copy the tools if you don't copy the behavior. It won't work. So, and that's the problem most lean people struggle with. They copy the tools, but they don't copy the behaviors. And Toyota is a cult. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Toyota is a very specific way of behaving and acting that's got eight decades of, of refinement and people are highly trained to behave in that way. So, so you're saying they you, developed that culture? Sorry? So you're saying they developed that culture over time? Yes. And it's an emerge, it's the culture has emerged. So you can't go copy the tools if you don't copy the behaviors. So when we talk about Genji Genbutsu, go and see, 
you've really got to understand what that really truly means. You can't just, just wander about aimlessly staring, at th aimlessly staring at things. So that isn't going to work. Unless you copy the actual behaviors, then the tool of go and see, and it's actually really go and observe and take the next action if you truly understand the phrase, won't work. I said that word, Pam, work. Um, yeah, I'm Thank seeing, you I'm very much. Daniel's this was really system. helpful. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking at... Um, oh, yeah, I'm looking at some of the things in here. So I'm going to shut up and let everybody say what they want to say. I think you're full of it, but you're full of good information. That's what I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Harry. It's awesome, hey, man. There you go. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, we never got the silly picture because, you know, well, I'll take I'll a screenshot. So hold on. I'll do oh, I the got some. I got so, some. I'm looking for right. a better one. Everybody needs to do something look stupid. I don't know, however you want to look stupid. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay, I took a picture. I don't know what it'd be like. I'll, I'll send you. So what I'll do, the recording I'll upload to YouTube. I'll send a link via Eventbrite to the materials. I'll put a link to the materials on the YouTube. Of course, I'll put a link to the YouTube on the, the video as well. And I'll send the, and I'll put the photograph on the Eventbrite email so you all get a copy of it. Thanks, everybody. I think it was fun. I mean, I talked a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, but uh, thank you so much. Thanks to Pam. Thanks to James. Thanks to everybody else who helped. And uh, I'll see you all soon online. And I'll see you, Javier, in Puerto Rico as soon as the madness is over. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.